What's happening, folks? The Comics Kid 2099 here. Today, I am going to talk to you about an episode of Avatar The Last Airbender. I'm going to do a commentary on it, an audio commentary uh, that you can listen to while you watch the episode at home if you so desire. So, uh, what I want you to do is uh, put your DVD or Blu ray into the DVD player or your computer and uh, put in the episode Imprisoned, uh, episode six of book one of Avatar The Last Airbender and uh, put it at the earliest timestamps, timestamp 00, and uh, here in a second I'm going to tell you to play, and then if you want to, you can watch along with me as I try to keep you entertained while you watch for 23 minutes and 45 seconds. So uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and click play starting now. Uh, so, uh, this episode introduces Haru, uh, the Earthbender, and uh, I don't know if everyone liked this episode. Uh, this is one of those things, uh, I don't remember if I said this in the commentaries. You're probably going to get a whole lot of me saying, I don't remember if I said this in an earlier commentary, uh, because I record these in bunches, so like the first four episodes, I recorded them like a month ago. Uh, so, a little bit of behind the scenes uh interesting factoid if you will but anyway uh, uh i know i've said this on twitter before but like the episode the great divide uh which apparently everyone in the world just hated that episode uh and they kind of poke fun at that in season three when they did the ember island players that was actually one of my favorite episodes of the series at least for the last 15 seconds of the episode uh, but i'll talk about that more when we get there this is an episode i don't know if people liked it uh, I seem to recall hearing some... That kind of looks good. That looks like a... It may sound like... That looked a little bit like a coloring pencil background, if you will. Uh, that might sound like an insult, but I didn't mean it to because it looks really pretty. Um, yeah, this is, I think, one of those episodes where Sokka and Katara are kind of at each other's throats. And you kind of get irritated at both of them. But maybe I'm wrong. Um, and I guess every once in a while they have to do one of those because... Uh, you know, they're siblings, and siblings are going to bicker, and uh, there's always got to be uh, character drama. Um, the guy who does the YouTube channel, Just Right, I've been uh, diving into some of his... <laughs> that was a pretty good kind of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade uh, level joke right there with the librarian. Um, Sokka has a good point. I don't know why these two think they need to investigate that, but... Um, yeah, uh, the guy Just Right, he does the YouTube channel Just Right, where he kind of gives story writing advice uh, and dissects different shows and movies and talks about what they what they do right and what they do wrong. Uh, he was talking about, and I wish I remembered the exact words that he used for it, but he was talking about like when you watch Game of Thrones, uh, you have like, I think he called it macro conflicts and micro conflicts. And macro conflict would be like the Starks versus the Lannisters, but micro conflict would be like the Starks and the Karstarks deciding how to defeat the Lannisters. And so taking that to Avatar, I was thinking about how like you've got to have micro conflicts every now and then. And Sokka and Katara is generally where you're going to get your micro conflicts because uh, they're constantly butting heads with each other. Sokka. Uh, eventually kind of evolves into the more pragmatic character, whereas Katara, a lot of times, she's not wrong in what she wants to do, but she's wrong in how she goes about it. I do like Sokka and Aang there in the background, kind of goofing off while Katara sees what needs to be said and done. Um, she just, like, walks into these people's house, like, doesn't, doesn't have any respect for their privacy. Aang, did you pay for that hat, boy? They saw you... Oh, Haru, you are in so much trouble. Um, <laughs> um, danger is my middle name. Uh, he did something dangerous. Oh, here we go. <laughs> they see you opening the, the blind, Sokka. <laughs> Who are you trying to fool? They believed that you were all thoroughly un-American. That's a reference to... <laughs> I played it. I, I, I should have waited. That's a reference to Clue, my second favorite movie of all time. Double the tax. Accident? I think he's threatening you guys. Uh, it's just so hard to control. Aang knows that, or he will know that whenever he tries to bend fire. Those don't even look like coins. They look like washers that... He, I think that's everything she just paid you guys. <laughs> He is a nice guy, Sokka. 
he has a family at home that he has to feed with these taxes. No, I'm just kidding. He has no family. He's a one-dimensional, mustache-twirling bad guy. Um, yeah, it's just that, you know, people who do something about it get kidnapped, Haru. We don't want to get kidnapped and put on a chain gang. What are, Haru, what are you even staring at right now? No one's sitting over there in that corner. Yeah, here's the thing. Okay, so Katara is putting Haru on a pedestal, saying, like, he's a wonderful, beautiful human being because he's an earthbender, and you guys are asking him not to earthbend. And I don't know if Katara understands why her village was attacked by firebenders, but her mom died because they thought she was a waterbender, and now she's over here saying that Haru shouldn't be suppressing his earthbending these guys are just complete monsters for asking him not to earthbend and it seems to me like asking haru not to earthbend is the sensible choice because it will get him killed or kidnapped um i mean it got katara's mom killed uh and i don't know if there were any other people in the village who died when katara's mom was killed but at the very least she should remember hey my mom died at the hands of the fire nation and like Unless you have an actual fighting force, then asking Haru to earthbend is kind of dumb. Um, and it's one of those things where, like, the series wants you to be on Katara's side, but if you actually use your brain and think logically, like, she's being kind of an idiot right now. Um, and somebody had commented on my commentary on the first episode saying that they were kind of surprised that I didn't like Katara, and they were com commenting that, all the characters in the series are flawed, and they all have their good qualities and bad qualities, and that might be true, but the problem is, for me, and I'm sure I'm one of, I'm in the minority here, because I know I had a friend in high school who's a big fan of Katara, uh, this show wasn't around when I was in high school, I'm just saying, uh, actually, it was, actually, uh, I, I don't know if I watched this show until after I graduated high school, but I think it started when I was in high school, but, um, this old man right here, man, I just wanted to just punch him in the face. Uh, anyway, um, what does Haru think he's doing? <laughs> he's just getting dirty. Like, come on, man. Uh, anyway, um, the problem I have is that Katara might have good qualities, but her stupid qualities vastly outweigh her good qualities. In case in point, in this episode, where she says that Haru should use his earthbending because it's a beautiful, natural thing, and then he gets arrested, and she should know from experience that that is dangerous and that he could get himself killed doing that, and she's just not thinking. Um, it'd be fine if we had more of a balance, if the characters, um, you know, it, it kind of reminds me of The X-Files, where you get eternally frustrated with Scully because she sees a werewolf in one episode and in the next episode she doesn't believe in the supernatural. But you know you know Mulder is right, that the supernatural does exist, but he doesn't use his actual logic to prove that these things exist. He just says, well, they exist and that's that. And so you're kind of frustrated with both the characters. And it's kind of what I'm getting here is that Katara, we know that she's right because we want to see these characters use their bending to fight against the injustices of the Fire Nation, but she's not using her brain and how that needs to be done. And so that's why, at least in this episode and probably many other episodes, that's why, come on man, in the middle of the night, these guys saved your life and then in the middle of the night you have to get Haru dragged from his bed. Anyway, um... Yeah, so that's, at least in this episode, that's why I don't like Katara, because she's just infuriating. Uh, now, whoever it was, I can't remember who you were, and I apologize that I don't remember your name, but maybe I'll come to like Katara more throughout this series, but at least right now, so far, it looks like same story, same song and dance. I didn't like her before, and I don't like her now. Um, yeah, because you told him to Earth then, you dummy. Um, anyway... It is your fault. At least she's at least she's owning up to it, although she'll continue to be stupid throughout the rest of the series. But hey, that's that's neither here nor there. Wow, that just a second ago it looked like a Sokka, it looked like they like didn't have his arm on there. It was weird. I'm not gonna rewind, obviously. Can't do that on a commentary. Um Oh yeah, this I like this plan here. This is a good I remember somebody Somebody was recently talking about how they thought this was stupid, and now 
I can't remember if that was in a comment of, oh man, I wish I remember who it was that, that was talking about this scene, because I don't, I don't have a whole lot of cause, I, I don't meet people very often, in air quotes, real life, who talk about Avatar, so I don't think it was someone I was talking to, and I don't think it was, man, somebody just recently was talking about this scene right here, and saying how much they didn't like it, and how stupid they thought it was, and I wonder if it was someone who commented on one of my commentaries. Um, it might have been, but I don't remember. Um, some of their animations here, like Katara's face there, look pretty good. Um, uh, <laughs> Sokka. I like how he just quietly says, seriously, back off. <laughs> that That's that's pretty good. Um. <laughs> I love the over-the-topness. So whoever it was who said they didn't like this scene, I think they said it was just that the, uh, the Fire Nation guys are kind of dumb, but, you know... I don't know, like, they think it's a lemur. I, I think it's funny. Uh, it's like I said in the previous episode, you know, the cabbage guy is refused entry into Ba Sing Se, or in, into Omashu, and then, like, ten minutes later, we see him in Omashu, and, like, it doesn't make any sense, but the rule of funny is supposed to outweigh the rule of logic. And so, in this case, uh, he's tugging on his ears. <laughs> okay, uh, that's pretty good. So, in this case the rule of uh, funny is supposed to outweigh the rule of characters having common sense. Obviously, a Fire Nation guy shouldn't think that a lemur is an earthbender, but it's funny, and I think it works. Um, now, I don't think, like right now, yeah, it's cloudy up here, so maybe and maybe these guys aren't looking up, but they're not exactly being subtle riding this gigantic sky bison but this is their only method of transportation. But, like, in this case... Oh, wait. This is the episode with, uh... This has got, uh... What's his face? George Takei. He voices, uh, the guy who's the warden of the... I forgot that this was that episode. And they do mention people... A couple of the guards mention that they saw a flying bison slash flying buffalo. Uh, so, yeah. I was just thinking, like, hey, they're not being very subtle. And then I realized that this is... Uh, there's George Takei right here. Um... Then I realized this is actually called out in the episode. So uh, now, are all of these guys Earthbenders? Um, because that's it's odd that like when Aang and his friends. Uh... <laughs> okay, no, that's, I thought he was gonna knock him in the water. Um, that comes later. Spoilers, but that comes later. Um, it's not as funny. I shouldn't have laughed. But later he throws someone overboard and it is kind of funny. So when Katara and her friends come to the village later on, uh, Haru's mom is acting like, oh, the Fire Nation's been here for a while and they've taken all of our earthbenders, um, except for Haru because he hit it. And now suddenly, like, five or six people are brought here at the same time as Katara. Are all of them earthbenders or were they resisting in other ways? Like, did they refuse to pay their taxes or were they trying to fight without earthbending and then they got captured? Um, I feel like if they tried to start a revolt, they would have just been killed. But then maybe, maybe they didn't want to, I don't know, maybe they just thought it'd be silly for Qatar to be brought there by herself. So they wanted to bring a bunch of other people. But I got the feeling that this has been going on for a while and you wouldn't think that these people who are earthbenders would be so foolish like Haru was, or, you know, foolish to listen to Katara, and so, uh, and there's not even that many people here, they just brought, like, five, there's maybe, like, 25 of them, maybe 50, I don't know, um, yes, it is, Katara, it was entirely 100% your fault, um, of course, Katara is a waterbender, and they are surrounded by water, could that come into play in the episode? I don't think so, but Tyro. Um, oh, wait! That guy, he was the voice of the bison in The Adventures of Virtue. Did you guys ever watch that show? That was in uh, back in the 90s. Uh, you know, had the two kids, and they would go out into the forest, and there was a bison, there was a hawk, there was like a ferret, and uh, something else, a uh, weasel, maybe? And then... Uh, they would tell stories like, uh, you know, in the book of Proverbs, something, something. Yeah, that's that guy. Um, he plays a bison in that, and there's a bison in this. Ah, ah. Okay. Uh, the plan. 
yeah. Katara, you just made a big mistake getting yourself arrested. These guys don't feel like resisting. Not after they've been brought here and the fight's been beaten out of them. You should know better than that, little girl. I kind of, I just keep expecting him to say, Odysseus got inside a wooden horse and brought down an entire city. My voice is not very good. Who is that guy? Because that's not, that's not Keith David, but... I mean, he kind of has that same booming voice as him. Um, I'm going to look him up while while we watch. Oh, here's the first of many Katara pep speeches. And I say that trying to keep the disdain out of my voice. Um, I only say that keeping the disdain out of my voice because, spoilers, her pep speech doesn't work here. Right here. But maybe I should just stop spoiling the episode. Uh, let you guys... Come along for the ride. I'm assuming if you are listening to my commentaries that you have seen the episode before. And if you haven't, then I, well, I don't know why you would do that. Um, Adventures, is it in the Book of Virtue or? Nope. Adventures of the Book of Virtue, maybe. I'm going to look up that guy. If it kills me, I'm going to do it. Maybe I just need to type in Book of Virtue. Maybe it wasn't Adventures at all. There we go. That started in 1996. Ten years before this series. I don't know if this series started in 96 or if the DVD came out in 96. Because so I was looking at the, the DVD credits on here and it said something about copyrighted 2006. So I don't know if the DVD came out then or if this series started in. Kevin Michael Richardson. That's who it is. He's done all kinds of stuff. Uh, he's well known in animation. Uh, I want to say he's... You, you've definitely watched something with him even if you didn't know that it had him in it. Oh, Katara. Aang, Sokka, I suggest you guys just leave her in this prison and you keep going on your adventure. Um, no, but we can abandon you. I just suggested that. Yes, they are. So Here's the thing. Sokka generally is grumpy and can often be sometimes a downright jerk, but a lot of times he has the most practical advice or solution in a given situation. And, oh, here it is. Oh, yes. <laughs> I love this scene. Um, fine bison. What? Fine buffalo. <laughs> See, this is, uh, overall, this episode is pretty heavy, so the moments of comedy, I think, are my favorite bits. Like, whoever it was who's complaining about the uh, earth-bending uh, lemur, I don't remember who it was who was complaining about that. To me, that works so well because it, it balances out the really heavy drama stuff that we get in this episode. You know, you're in a prisoner of war camp. That's not exactly fun, lighthearted material for a children's cartoon, so you have to throw in goofy stuff like a guy throwing his man overboard because he didn't know if it was a bison or a buffalo. I, I think it works well, um, and that's the kind of stuff I remember the bison-buffalo thing, you know, years after watching this episode, and some of the rest of this stuff, while it's well written, it doesn't stick with me as much as those comedy bits that we're getting there. Um, so, yeah. I think that, um, yeah, but the, you're not going to meet no metal benders for a while. Oh. Oh. You know, from a distance, that almost looks like the, the oil refinery that um, uh, Batman Sub-Zero, the climax of that movie, takes place in. Maybe not. Maybe just vaguely it's a refinery. So uh, I was, I guess, subconsciously thinking of that. You know, this is a trope that I love whenever you have characters explaining a heist or something, and we're, this is how it's going to happen. And then they're explaining it as we see it happen. Uh, I, I love that. Um, now, in this case, uh, we're kind of sort of seeing them explain it, as, and then we're actually seeing it happen. Like, 
I guess what I'm thinking of is when we see them explain something and then it goes the way that they think it's going to go in their explanation and then we get to see them do it and it doesn't happen the way I, I don't know I'm, I can't think of a good example of that right now but oh man and then we find out that Aang died of the black lung in his 60s I'm just kidding I don't know what he died of Now, Poito from Adventures of the Book of Virtue, you guys need to pick up your weapons and fight against George Takei here. Now, here's a question. Why do some of the Fire Nation guards have the little skull mask thing, like those guys standing with George Takei, but then some of them, like the two who reported to him about the flying buffalo, they weren't wearing masks? Um, I don't know if it has anything to do with rank, because like their costumes here pretty clearly look the same. There's a few minor differences, but... Like, well, no, I guess their costumes are pretty different from George Takei's, but, uh-oh. Oh, snap! Yeah, but if Cole burns, then, yeah, I was, you're going to run out of ammunition against these guys, I would think. They could just, like, destroy your coal, couldn't they? Or, you know, make it useless as a weapon. Um, did they mention how many guards are on this refinery? Because I would think, like, okay, see, those guys, I don't think they were wearing the skull. These guys are skull faces. Um, oh. I guess all these guys are earthbenders because they're, you know, here. Oh, and they just made something heavy. Yeah, see, those guys weren't wearing skull face masks. I don't know. I don't know if there's a reason. I'm assuming it has something to do with rank. Like, if you're wearing a skull face mask, you're a higher rank than somebody who's not skull faced. Ooh. This is a pretty good line coming up. I hear cowards float. Ah. That's a... That, a lot of this series, I think, is stuff that I don't remember is coming up, and then right before it happens, it's like, oh, hey, I remember that line, or I remember that scene. Like, I had completely forgotten that this one had the flying buffalo incident, and then as I was thinking about that, it started to come to me. Um, yeah, don't give her the big head, or she'll think that she needs to be insufferable all the time. Um, yes, you guys should have fought back in the first place. It shouldn't have taken a 12-year-old girl to tell you to do that. How old are these characters? I know Zuko is a couple years older than the others, but, like, I think Aang is 12, right? And I'm assuming Katara is about that age, and I think Sokka is obviously a little bit older than her, but, like, Zuko, I think, is 16? Does that sound right? I, I don't know if they ever actually mention it. Um, now, is this the one where she loses her necklace? Yep. Uh, yeah, I knew it. I knew it. And then here we go. Yeah, baby. The prince. Here he is. Of course, that doesn't really do you much good because they're not here now, Prince Zuko. Okay. Well... That was a fun episode. Um, I will talk to you guys a week from now with another commentary uh, on another episode of Avatar The Last Airbender. So until then, I hope that you guys have a great rest of the day, and I'll catch you later. Have a good one.